First Class Fatherhood. That is where Alec Lace comes in with his popular podcast. And one of the most interesting was on a podcast. Alec Lace interviews high profile fathers from actors to NFL players with a vision to change the narrative of fatherhood and family life. Joining me now, First Class Father, Ryan McPartland. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. Thank you, sir. All right, let's start here. How many kids do you have? How old are they? I have two kids. They're 13 and 15. I can't believe I'm saying that. Uh, the 13-year-old is Dylan, and the 15-year-old is Wyatt. Very cool. What kind of sports activities are you into? Uh, I am coaching the younger one in youth football, and the older one is playing basketball. He, he tried to do both football and basketball, but they really make you choose in high school. It's not like it used to be. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. So uh, if you could, Ryan, please just take a second here to hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do. Well, basically, uh, I'm an actor producer, uh, but I'd actually classify myself as a husband and father, first and foremost. Um, you know, I do everything. I'm most known as Captain Awesome from the show Chuck, uh, which ended 10 years ago, but I love that new audiences are still finding it on HBO Max. Uh, it used to be on Prime Video and Netflix. So, um, and then, you know, I'm also known for Hunter Killer. I played a Navy SEAL uh with uh, gerard butler and uh living with fran i was uh fran's younger boyfriend uh a long time ago i was on the pa i was on the soap opera passions a uh, lot of hallmark and lifetime christmas movies so some of my audience uh might know me from there and basically just a suburban dad <laughs> you know <laughs> first and foremost well, take me back to the beginning of that journey then, Ryan. You said 15 years. So about about how old were you then when you first became a dad? And how did that experience change your perspective on life? Oh, it's funny, man. I, I remember I'm still in the same house that we brought our kids home. I'm very nostalgic. So I'm going to have a hard hard time letting go of this house if I do one day. Um, so man, I remember walking my son through the door after he had a little bout of uh, – uh, he had to do the billy blanket for uh, jaundice, you know, for a couple of days. And just any little thing, you're just on high alert when when you're a new parent. And I remember not realizing how much it affected me emotionally until I walked him through the door of our house and I just burst out crying. Like, oh, he's home now. He's safe. And uh, I made a little promise to him that I'll never let anything happen to him at that, at, you know, from that day forward. Uh, so I'm a little bit of a helicopter parent, but, you know, I also have the conversation with him that, you know, I'm teaching him to be an independent young man. And that's that's my role is to be a teacher more than a, a parent and, you know, oversee every move, try and control every move or situation that he's in. Um, but at the same time, I'll never forget that day of walking through that door and and your life does change. My life changed. I, I remember telling my friends because I was the first one to have kids of, um, you know, a lot of my siblings and my friends. And, you know, it, it really quickly prioritizes everything in your life. For instance, I said, OK, I'm not doing the bars and going out and staying out and trying to hang and be both a, a good father and a good friend of my buddies that were still hanging at the bars late at night. Um, I'm not, um, I'm not, uh, you know, staying up late and sleeping in the morning, uh, sleeping in anymore because you're on their schedule. So when I decided that I was going to do it right, just like anything I try and take on, I decided, Hey, what's the new schedule going to be? What's the new me going to be? What's my new peer group going to be? And then you find yourself uh, amongst a lot of friends that also have kids at the same age and you know whether you whether you know it subconsciously or consciously you're trying to surround yourself with people that uh, are like-minded have the same values and are trying to accomplish um you know and it's a weird thing because when i say accomplish you're not you're, it's a day-to-day -day accomplishment there's not a you know there's not one day where you're like i'm done being a dad i did my job it's like you just try and get through each day and go what did I do wrong? What did I do right? And uh, you, you really rely on a lot of friends and peers that you have that are going through the same things.
Yeah, you're right on with that. I mean, I was I was 25 myself. I have four kids now, but we, you know, I was 25 when I had my first, and I was young for my friend group and and guys that I work with to have kids. And you get that, you know, you, you, they break your balls, they don't understand it, and then years later when they become dads, they have these like they look back through a different set of goggles and like, Oh, I was never like that to you. And like, yep. you know, now they, they seem to understand it a little bit more. And it, it seems like it's kind of late in the game today. I mean, years ago, but by 25, most people already had their families. Like it seems like now we get, most people are starting later on in life where, um, That's you know, right. when you start having them young. It, it seems like, uh, it, it seems like your friends are like, wow, you're having kids already. Yeah. I came from a family of four kids and I would have loved to have four kids, but I started, closer to 30 years old. Um, and it's funny also as an actor, you know, everything was determined by if I got another season on another show, could I afford or, or am I going to be unemployed and bring a child into this world <laughs> and or another child into this world? And that's a whole nother thing because to, to walk in a room and try and uh, to beat uh, out a thousand other actors, um, you got to have this confidence, right? And, um, when you don't have that confidence and you're like, oh man, I got this pressure of being a new father. It's hard. It's really hard. And I'm sure everyone can relate to that in any area, in any business. Now at, th at this stage of your acting career, being a dad, has that had any influence on which particular roles you try out for or that you're looking to, uh, accept and to do? Has it changed anything as far as your career goes like that? Yeah, a hundred percent. I, I've never been a prude by any means. Um, I grew up in a bit of a conservative household, but you know, it just, it all has to have purpose to me. And I just had this conversation with a good friend who's a writer on a show yesterday. And because we're creating a new show and there'll be some violence in it, but the violence has to be a why, and it has to be reluctant and not exploitative. Um, and it just has, you know, there's certain roles that I just look at and I say, oh, this is just like a video game. It's it's shoot them up for the sake of shooting them up. And it's not really contributing to anything. The story's not contributing anything to this world. So, I mean, I'm, but what made me become an actor was watching the movie, um, was watching the movie Braveheart. And I loved that movie. I came out of my seat. I was riveted by that movie at the time. It was just groundbreaking to me and where I was at in life. And um, I felt that was a situation of, of good men having to do bad things for a purpose. And that's, that's the lens I, I view uh, the roles, the things I want to produce. Uh, you know, what kind of situation are you put in? where you have to fight your way out of it if there is going to be violence. Yeah, very well said. And what about as far as your kids? Do they, do they watch most of the stuff that you do? Are they interested in your career? Are they, do, they, do any of your, your kids have interest in, in pursuing and following your footsteps at all? You know, they do. I moved up to um, the city of Santa Clarita. It's called. It's about 25 miles north of L.A. Because before I had kids, we decided to move here. Um, because I wanted it to be very much centered on their world. I wanted it to be about high school sports. I wanted it to be about, you know, going to dances in LA, uh, you know, it's a lot of, uh, frankly, a lot of private schools, a lot of who are your parents, what, what car are you driving, all of that stuff. And I was like, no, 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 I'm going to get out of that. So they've had a very normal childhood and it wasn't until the pandemic that they sat down, they knew what I did for a living. But they didn't really watch much of what I did. It wasn't until the pandemic that they sat down and we watched Chuck from the beginning. And you could see the light turn on like, oh, they're having a lot of fun making that show. <laughs> and dad wasn't really working that hard. He was having a good time. The hard work was getting the job. And then once I got that job, that was five seasons of just having a blast and getting to go to work with my friends and uh, still maintaining those relationships. So I think that's what they're interested in, you know, more than feeling like they have to get on stage or be the center of attention. I could see them wanting to do some comedy. My advice is learn how to write and produce along with acting from the get-go 
because you can make a career out of all three and then you're hedging your bets and you're always busy that way. I came late to the game and producing and I'm dipping my toe into writing a little bit, but, um, you know, it's at some point when you, the jobs aren't there, you got to create them for yourself. And it seems like, Ryan, right now, uh, more so than ever, there's more opportunity for people to get discovered because so many people are putting stuff up on TikTok and on social media, Facebook, Instagram. It seems like it's flooded with the shorter version of videos. And it seems like it's, a, it's shortening the attention span. I don't know if it's if, if eventually over time we're going to see movies start to come. I know like all these Marvel movies do really well and it's like they're three hour sagas. And I'm surprised that this generation can sit through a three hour movie like that. And I would imagine at some point the movies will start getting shorter and shorter as these attention spans uh, keep getting smaller and smaller. That's a really interesting point. I, I think that Look, there's a formula to every one of these mediums. So it doesn't matter if it's social media. It doesn't matter if it's um, Stranger Things or Marvel movies. There's a formula. And, you know, you'll probably find yourself watching a TikTok video that's 10 or 15 minutes. If at the right time you're about to tune out or, you know, swipe on by, they hook you with another moment you know, another, oh, wait for it, or what the thing, because the whole goal of social media is to get you watched to the end, and then it, it goes to more people and becomes more popular. That's why they're becoming shorter and shorter. Um, so if you do a long form of that, and it doesn't matter if it's a movie or a TV series, binging TV series, you, you got to have little cliffhangers, right? So what used to be at a season ending cliffhanger on the soap opera Dallas for my parents to watch now is like in a 10 second TikTok video that you're like, Oh, there's a cliffhanger. Oh, I got to see the next thing. Oh, I got to see the next thing. So that's, that's the storytelling formula that goes back to Aristotle, you know? <laughs> so there, yeah. there's, there's always a hero and you got, and then there's an obstacle and then there's um, you know, the catharsis moment. So you just got to um, I, I'm, I'm confident that storytelling will always be around in all these different mediums. I don't think one I mean, at times one will dominate over the others. But everyone thought the movie uh, going experience was dead until Maverick came out. And then and look at us all go and rush and make that the billion dollar movie that it was. Yeah. Yeah, you're right about that. And I know how I, I sometimes what's good, too, is that we have access to be able to I, I share with my kids. I'm a big old movie guy. Like I love all the James Cagney, Humphrey Bogart, Three Stooges, oh, Marx yeah. Brothers type stuff. So it's like it's cool to be able to share those things with my kids. But also, like I show them like those old Batman serials that they would show like a like a six minute clip of a short before they would show the actual movie. And it's like it would leave you with that cliffhanger and be like, come at this theater next week and see what happens. And it, now when somebody releases a series, most of the series like I know I uh, had Jack Carr on the show that did the terminal list. Uh, wh wh when they do that, they just release the whole thing right out there. So you can just binge watch the whole show. It's no longer like, hey, next week, get the next series. It's like, it's like boom, there it is all there right now. Yeah, you know what? I think that you're right as far as depending on what medium it is, it's going to be you're going to see um, people revert and especially marketing execs. Uh, kind of try and dominate this and revert back to uh, exactly what you're talking about is creating a cliffhanger that drives people that gives them a, a tease and then drives them to the theater. And I think the more that you can do that, the better off um, the theater, you know, business will remain or, you know, TV or streaming the, the, there is so much content right now. It is becoming consolidated it will go back to, you know, it won't go back to just three channels anymore, but there's only so much people can watch. Okay. And the more metrics that are available, the um, less money that will be there to share amongst all of these different streaming services and, and uh, network programs and everything else. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how it goes moving forward. But bringing it back into you as a father here, Ryan, uh, what kind of disciplinarian would you say you are as a father? And is that different than the discipline style you grew up with? Oh, it's definitely di different. You know, I, I never, you know, when I look back on um, my father, who uh, did a great job, 
just you always knew there was love no matter what and it was just like there's always love and at the end of the day anything that um that any kind of punishment i got was pretty well deserved uh i remember apologizing to him when i went off to my first year of college thinking that i was ready to get out of the house and i was independent i was gonna go play football i went to the university of illinois to go play football and i was like oh i'm done i don't need you anymore and then I was like, oh, my God. Oh, this is the real world. Oh, these are bills that need to be paid. Oh, this is how much tuition and books and housing costs and and oh, my meals and everything else. And I just called him and I just said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for complaining about anything and feeling entitled to uh, anything you've done for us, because this guy ran a business uh, we had a vacation home that obviously we had, a, I was complaining about having to do all the work at the, at our house and then at the vacation home and never getting a vacation because it was so much work. And then, um, but I just looked back, like it all hit me in the face of how entitled I felt. Um, and I never forgot that. And I never, uh, I never, um, lost that feeling of going, okay, I'm going to teach my kids that none of this is theirs they are not entitled they are everything i'm doing is trying to raise them to be uh solid young men leaders and um you know being able to take care of not only themselves but others as well and it's hard sometimes because you forget their their brains are small <laughs> and they're not going to be fully developed for another you know 10 to 12 years so they don't they don't have that perspective and sometimes you just got to let them age out of whatever stage they're in but um i'm a i'm a firm believer in um just finding whatever it is that makes them tick and you know or whatever it is they value most whether it's time with friends playing video games or whatever and just removing that and and saying hey listen this is you punishing yourself I'm reading a book right now. Uh, I went back to it. Um, uh, seven highly, uh, you know, the seven effective habits. Uh, the highly successful people. Of highly successful people, whatever. He did one for families too, Stephen Covey. So I went back to that and I actually took up some good tips from it and just saying, hey, what's the most important thing that your kids listen to you or that they become, you know, and they, they obey you or they become independent and then from there interdependent so that they're great teammates. And the, it's, it all starts with that mission statement that you got to do as a family of when things are going really well around the house, when things are going bad, when they're off the rails, what does that look like? What can we do to prevent that? Is it the night before making sure that everybody's lined up for the next day so we're not freaking out and yelling at each other? We got to go. We got to do this. And then that building up. Um, and just knowing what responsibilities are, because I mean, the, the end goal is obviously to have your kids feel like, Hey, they're creating their own consequences for their own actions. And then following through with those consequences when they know they've messed up. And I mean, <laughs> so much easier said than done, but we're working at it and I think that's it it's just a it's a struggle it's a constant um, process and as long as you're working towards a goal I think that's the most important thing yeah I, I agree I think sometimes I look at my teenagers my oldest is 16 and I have another one 15 and it's like I look at them and I'm like man in a few years these guys are going to be on their own I'm like we're way we're way behind the eight grade here but it's I, I think sometimes too I have that revisionist mindset that I tell them with like oh I always did this when I was a kid or yep. I always did you know and, and that's the farthest thing from the truth and I had to go through it I had to learn and, and that's all part of the process but almost like you were saying at the beginning there when you were talking about how uh you said to your dad hey I'm sorry for giving you the trouble I think as 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 fathers, we, I think everybody experiences that where we start to, it starts to click and we say, Oh man, now I know what my mom was talking about. Now I know what my father was talking about. And you just get it now in a way that you never could before you actually had kids of your own. That's right. That's absolutely right. And it's sometimes it happens earlier than others. Some people never get over that childhood trauma and only see things through the lens of being a child. And I think that's, uh, that's sad because once you realize what background they had and that that their parents didn't come with a playbook they didn't come with a playbook that they might have done the best they thought they knew how 
or just were crippled by, you know, some other um, limiting thoughts or beliefs in their life that they weren't good enough to do this or they weren't capable of doing that. Or they sometimes it's just they're too damn busy trying to keep a roof over your head to sit and tell you why you need to take the garbage out, you know, and that's that's what I looked back on and said, oh, man. The, the amount of stress my dad put on himself to be a good dad and provide for everybody, um, you know, is what I respected more than anything. And he did, he provided. And that's where I went, Oh shit, man, I'm sorry that I didn't contribute more and uh, that I was just expecting more, you know? And it's so important too, Ryan, because I mean, so many of the dads are walking away and that's what's leaving us in like a, our country in a shamble here. I talk about the fatherless crisis. We have so many kids are growing up without a dad or a father figure in their life and whatever that may be through a family court system and a bad divorce or uh, a dad that just ha is too overwhelmed and walks away from his family. I mean, they're leaving kids that are growing up without a dad. And, and it's really it's at the root cause of almost every problem that we have in our country. We, we quickly forget just how important and vital the father's role is uh, to either a son or a daughter in their development in life. hundred percent. And I think that, you know, that's the number one thing. When we put too much pressure on ourselves as fathers, you just got to remind yourself to show up, be present, be present. And you might, you might fly off the handle. You might overreact. You might, um, you know, say something that you don't mean, but how much more important is it that you're just there and that you can come back and say, Hey, I'm sorry for overreacting. This is what it stems from. I'm going to take a quiet moment to explain myself, but also you guys got to get yourselves in line. You know, this isn't about me. This is about you as children and, and making you the best version of yourself, being able to take care of yourself and take care of others in the future. So it's, it's just tough. And I realized what an important role coaches are playing in our society. So as much, um, I'm coaching youth football right now. And I was, listen, I played football for the university of Illinois. I played and it, it had a big impact on my life. Um, but at the same time, I was very nervous about concussions and about the health and safety. And you weigh those things and you go, okay, well, there's concussions in hockey and lacrosse and soccer and everything else. And I'm not trying to pit one sport against the other, but I'm just, you know, I think it's just so vital to have sports in our lives and, um, and have coaches that can act as those father figures or additional father figures. I know we've had a couple instances this year where these kids at, um, they needed, they needed some discipline. They needed, uh, they needed someone to go, Hey, these are the, these are the boundaries and don't step outside of them. And by the way, you have potential. You have a lot of potential. I'm here to try and get that potential out of you. Uh, but the character is the most important thing. Yeah, and there's no way to really put a, a you know a price tag on that. And even if it's a kid that's not into sports and doesn't find it in a coach, finds it in a teacher or an instructor or a, a director of a play or whatever it is. Absolutely. To, Absolutely. to find that is, is is so incredibly important. So um, I love the fact that you're involved. You're doing it. You're coaching. Uh, I know we have a mutual friend. You're in a writing project right now. What other kind of uh, what's next for you here? What can we expect to see from you here in the future? Yeah, our mutual friend is Travis Lively, uh, former U.S. Navy SEAL, and uh, I, I put him together with Mark Cherry from Desperate Housewives, and we decided um, what's the best way to tell a story of and bring two, two of these minds together with me, who I've uh, been on Chuck and I've been on Devious Maids, uh, one of Mark's shows, and we came up with a show called Jenny is a Weapon, and it's a really fun um, kind of superhero mom story where it's going to put uh, Jenny, who's this 40-something-year-old um, housewife, in the middle of this team of futuristic soldiers. And um, <laughs> it's going to be her impact on them and their impact on her. And it's got the it's got a lot of fun elements to it. And I don't want to give too much away now because I don't want Fox to get mad at me <laughs> when when we're ready to release the show. It really the promotion of it should be uh, in their hands. But uh, everyone's in, in 
and, you know, and for a big treat with this because we wanted something that's what's called co-viewing now. That's the new Hollywood technical term for family entertainment. So husband will sit down, mom's going to sit down, kids are going to sit down, and we're all going to watch this as a family, just like Chuck. Yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt we definitely need more of that in our culture for sure, especially from the entertainment industry. And obviously, you know, I love Travis. Uh, I'm sure him being involved it sounds like a fun project. I'm sure it's going to be great. So I look forward to seeing that uh, when it comes out. So last thing I want to hit you with here, Ryan, you may have touched on a little bit as we were talking throughout the show here. But um, I love to ask all the dads that I get on the podcast, what type of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about to be father who's out there listening? Uh, for the new dad, my advice is the same advice that I gave all my friends when they became new dads. Let go of your old self. Let go. The new self that you may be reluctant to embrace will be a whole lot better. And I trust me when I say this, the new self that is, you know, sleeping when your baby sleeps uh, on a different schedule that has different priorities. Um, you will bond with your child and your family so and it'll be the best relationships you'll ever have in your life. Yeah, very well said. I love the message. Been a lot of fun for me. I gotta say, Ryan McFarlane, you're a first class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time here on First Class Fatherhood. Thank you, Alec. Really, really great talking to you, man. You have been listening to First Class Fatherhood. First Class Fatherhood is a family made media podcast. Please visit www.firstclassfatherhood.com or www.familymade.com to find out more details. You can order First Class Fatherhood advice and wisdom from high-profile dads on Amazon.com or wherever books are sold. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Proverbs 22.6 tells us, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will never depart from it. God bless, and I'll catch you next time.